Glory be to God, right now I would like to speak about the raising of Lazarus from the dead and focus in on some particulars that happen within this piece of history and bring up some crucial things that false believers have a problem with today still and I'll start at verse 15 of John 11 and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe nevertheless let us go on to him so the Lord is speaking to his disciples and he speaks in such a way to them and brings up this interesting saying to the intent you may believe okay so there's false christians that endorse an idea that once you believe you always believe which we know is not correct you can stop believing and in fact the lord does things so you may believe okay so you may continue in belief or in certain cases that you have turned from your belief that you may believe again. Either one is biblical and either one would agree with what the Lord says in verse 15 of John 11. And that's important because anyone who is actually a real believer today knows that you can turn from belief and knows that if you turn from belief you shall be damned because the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake that burns these are certain sayings in the scriptures that are very important now as i go down Jesus gets to this point. Well, actually, I should touch on 26. Okay. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So here we see that you have to be alive spiritually and believe. All right. So you can't believe like the devils okay because they're dead spiritually and if you have faith without works your faith is dead okay so there is no living requirement that you have met that is a prerequisite of never dying okay Although you might die physically, if you're spiritually alive when you leave this body, you'll ever be with the Lord and you'll never see the death of your soul. And this is what's important. But people with a dead faith, okay, a sinner who might have a head knowledge is not saved and will die. Okay. And it's important. Do you believe this? Like right now, do you believe this? This is how Jesus talked to people. Okay. Martha had knowledge of who Jesus was, okay? But at that exact moment, do you believe this? Okay. And she said, yes, okay? Now, without getting into every last detail about the sisters and the people, okay, we get down to verse 33. And Jesus groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Okay. And Jesus wept. Okay. I believe personally that Jesus was righteously groaning, of course. 
he had, he was weeping righteously. I believe he had a righteous anger toward the whole situation myself. And I think the way in which he speaks in these encounters reveals to us that the people were looking at things after the flesh. Okay. And they weren't understanding. You know, you may see some of this with the disciples before they even started going there. Okay, as this gets brought up. And you're just not looking at things after the Spirit. And then if they were looking at things after the Spirit and Lazarus, who Jesus loved, they would have thought this is great. You know, that he is loved of the Lord and he is asleep in the Lord. But typically you see the opposite with people that they don't understand how to handle death because they're carnal. And this world is all they have, you know, and these people fear death. So death is not a good thing for them. Okay, needless to say. And they typically then, although they might have some knowledge of different truths, not the whole truth, typically though, they don't understand how to handle death of anyone around them, what to say, so on and so forth. I would like to read a verse from Isaiah 57, starting at verse 1. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. I feel what is being taught here is that if a righteous man perishes in his righteousness, He's ever living, and, well, we can see this in verse 2. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Okay. They aren't getting what is really important. Okay. You can read this on the pages of the Bible, but... Do you really lay it to the heart? Okay, is it written on the heart? Do you look at things after the spirit? Okay, do you walk by faith, not by sight? Okay. Someone could say, yeah, I've read John 11 this many times. And it's the word of God, I believe it. But do you really believe it? Are you alive? Okay. Paul said, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay. And really the only thing that Paul was at to be twixt with was the fact that if he was here, it'd be better for others. Okay. Than to be with the Lord. It was really just about that. That was that simple to Paul. Okay. And... goes on in Isaiah to talk about the seed of falsehood and children of transgression and ultimately speaking the big picture most people just don't get it and that's why they are carnal okay it might just be in one or two ways in life in some cases it's in many more than that of course but it's a carnal way of thinking you know, if you say you really love God and you really want to be with Jesus and you want to reign with Christ in the kingdom and all these things, you have to examine yourself why you fear death, why you love this world. You're double-minded, okay? And that goes for other people that die. You know, if you're just looking at a saint that dies and... For example, maybe you're in great sorrow for yourself. Well, you know, there is a sadness, you know, to a saint that would die because he's not anymore with you in this earth. However, you can't over excel that. You can't then become in yourself 
selfish, okay? I think there is a godly course. However, I think it can become ungodly and it probably leads people to depression and damnable sin. But you have to look at yourself in those situations and there is a godly sorrow and there is a sorrow of the world, all right? However, I just wanted to bring those few things up because needless to say people look at things carnally and they don't see the big picture and then we see here as we go down in the chapter we read in 37 and some of them said cannot this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died so then we read Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Again, I really feel like Jesus has a righteous anger toward this because now you hear this and this is, you know, Jews, okay? Behold how he loved him, you know? What is your love, you know? In their mind, they're thinking, he loved him. Could not he have caused this man should not have died? And again, looking at things after the flesh, you know, you have people who may have been sign seekers, wanting to find fault with Jesus. And I've seen this come up in my life that people, you know, they expect you to do everything. And basically, not only do they expect you to do everything, but at their timing and for their cause and for their purpose. Okay. Like, why don't you heal that person? Well, my next question is, why don't they have faith to be healed? That could be my next question. My my next statement, perhaps, or a statement to rebuttal their fault finding is I work at God's will, not my own. Okay. You can't heal a person unless God gives you the power to. But if it's a spiritual problem, not that this was a spiritual problem, this was a physical issue here with Lazarus. But if it's a spiritual problem, you're never going to get those demons out of you until you repent and have faith. Okay, you need the blood and you need the Holy Spirit. Okay, another man ain't going to help you there. All right, and that's a big problem with quote unquote deliverance ministries that don't even understand salvation. And, you know, they're using devils to try to cast all devils out of people. And Satan's probably just laughing at them and mocking them. All right, but be that as it may, with this story, why question Jesus like this, the Jews? And there's questions people ask, well, why don't you heal them? Or like if you preach against people depressed or witchcrafts or marijuana or anything, why don't you heal us instead of rebuking us? I can't heal you. You need to repent, you know? So Jesus says, Said I not unto thee, verse 40, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. So again, it goes back to belief. What is your belief? Is it right now, right now, right now? Okay. Now, anyway, I think the bottom line is that there is a lot that you can glean from this. And then you see this saying and brings up this account of Caiaphas. And this is interesting. And I don't necessarily think I'm going to spend any time on this. But I will say that my initial thought is that Caiaphas was prophesying by a demon. And, you know, it's an awkward run of verses, perhaps, in some regard as to how to discern what is going on. But it's not that important. The believing and living, though, is very important. And fault finders, it's important to rebuke them. And, you know, we see that Jesus did different things within this story. And we see that these things obviously are not sin, the way Jesus acts. So you can groan in spirit. Okay, it's not a sin because we know Jesus never sinned. You can weep. It's not a sin. Okay. And you can be troubled. It's not a sin. There's something obviously quite righteous with what Jesus was doing because he's God and he is fully man, of course, as well, and never sinned. All right, so perhaps just then looking quickly at verse 12, there's one other point I wanted to bring up. 
is that Jesus makes this saying, okay, that he says, for the poor, verse 8, always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. And this goes to show you, I think, I feel, I reckon that the gospel and salvation and knowing Jesus comes before anything in life, even doing this sort of benevolence or charity toward the poor. Okay. Now there are some people that are just called and they have the means and they're not going to come into the gospel without having to repent of covetousness, obviously. And then there's some that had a direct call from God in a ministry to be a part of like the rich young ruler who cannot come into salvation without that repentance, without that faith, and which is said of the Lord Christ to be perfection in Matthew 19, 16 through 24. Be that as it may, Jesus comes first, okay? So if you don't have anything to give today, but you can preach the kingdom and the gospel thereof, you're preaching everything. You have everything. You are preaching something so priceless that you cannot weigh it on giving to the poor, okay? Like Paul said, if I give everything I have, at my body to be burned and I have not charity I have nothing so there is a charity that first and foremost is given through the gifts of the Holy Ghost and is of course the second great commandment which is like the first that fulfills the whole law that goes deeper okay then acts of kindness okay Acts of kindness are mandatory. You can't do acts of malice. However, the point is such that Jesus, you don't have always. Okay. And it's interesting. He says this to Judas. Okay. And that could open up a whole nother discussion. And then you have the different doctrines surrounding Judas. Was he always a thief? You know, and all that. People bring these things up and I've heard this different times with Judas. Well, it was a, you know, excuse me, Judas was a thief, you know, so he was never saved to begin with. Well, it says he was a thief, but I never say he was always a thief. You know, he was a thief then, but he wasn't always a thief, you know. Anyhow, it's a different topic. But yeah, I just wanted to touch on a few of these things. I was very encouraged by reading John 11 because I see that our Lord dealt with a lot of the same problems that we have to deal with, okay? And he gave such strong spiritual teachings amongst dealing with the flesh in this situation and how they must agree, okay? But when you take the flesh and you emphasize it too much, then you lose out the things of the spirit. But if you're walking after the Holy Ghost, you being in the flesh, you will not stumble. And it goes to prove to people that they can walk down the road following the sun that was breathed into existence by God and they can see outside and they can walk so long without stumbling. But then spiritually, they talk about how they're always a sinner. And you're reprobate before God, you're rejected of God, and you know, you're unsaved, okay? And I don't want to go into too many particulars about Martha and Mary, but I think if you diligently seek the Lord and see how the Lord spoke in these situations, there was problems there and there seemed to be wavering. And then there's these direct foolish comments, you know, like the Jews had. Like, why even bring something like that up? It's a fault-finding spirit, okay? You're always trying to put fault. And that's the way I'd like to end this video, is that, you know, be strong, okay? 
follow Jesus, walk in the light, you won't stumble. And Jesus Christ makes the viners mad. Jesus was one of the worst sinners of his time to the way a lot of people felt, okay? A lot of people looked at him as such a wicked person, okay? And in their mind, they had reasons why. Because he said this, or because he did this, or because he didn't do that. And it goes to show you that if the world hates him, they're going to hate you, all right? But do you testify against the world that their works are evil? Okay. And if you're doing it without hypocrisy, you're going to be hated. And there's going to be people that are going to look to find fault with what you're doing. And there's going to be people that they're not alive spiritually. They do not believe right now. And they hate Jesus Christ. So they're going to hate you. And they're just going to find fault with you. And they're going to be, of course, carnal doing that. And... In some cases, like Jesus did, he had to just walk away from the situation and go somewhere else. Okay? And that's what he did. So that's not a sin either. All right? But the bottom line is, they're going to do the same thing to you. Okay? And it's written that if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. I just read Jesus groaned and he was troubled. And, man, I believe... Honestly, if you're following the Holy Ghost today and you consider studying this story, you're going to feel his pain, okay? Because I don't think he was doing it emotionalistic way where he just felt so bad for the people in a righteous way. I think he was angry, personally. I really do. And it was a righteous anger, no, no doubt there. And... Our Lord is kind and patient, but with that kindness and patience and long suffering, he expects something, okay? And should it not lead you to repentance? 